Hello and welcome to the latest edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Rotorno. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today I am very happy. I am joined by Taku Mutsu and she works for the Tiki Highwood Foundation. So Taku, if I could just hand over to you, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and why you wanted to become a wildlife warrior. Um, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, thank you so much for hosting this event and for giving us an opportunity to just talk about conservation in a safe space that's quite lighthearted and free for anyone and everyone to be able to join. Um, my name is Taku Muteza, as you rightly introduced. And I come from Zimbabwe. I was born and raised here in Zimbabwe. Um, I did. I studied my law degree in at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And actually, when I studied law, my motivation was that I wanted to do something that would help me to be able to represent the vulnerable and the voiceless. So I didn't actually go to law school with the intention of studying wildlife law. Um, and I think at the time when I was studying, there wasn't actually a concept such as wildlife law yet. Um, but what I did know was that um, due to my background as a Zimbabwean, as a black woman, and also as someone that comes from from a minority tribe, I really wanted to do something that would help me to be able to represent the voiceless. And through my throughout my studies, I then actually got the opportunity to hear about an organization called the Wildlife Justice Commission in the Netherlands. And um, one of my mentors actually just said to me, Taku, I think this would be something that would resonate with you because it's connected to Africa, it's connected to your motherland, and it's also very much near to something that you would be interested in as someone that cares about um, representing the environment, that cares about nature and animals and such. And through that, I actually, that's how I got introduced to the plight of wildlife and the fact that this is a big crime that's linked to so many other things. It's linked to money laundering. It's linked to other smuggling crimes throughout the world. So that's how I actually ended up getting into wildlife law. And even right now, as it stands, it's still such a new thing. And I think there's very few lawyers right now in the world that are, are doing anything related to wildlife, um, specifically in Africa. So it's still a new concept and it's still something that requires a lot of development. Um, and I, as, as a passionate young African woman that wanted to do something to give back, that's how I ended up um, in wildlife law. And again, I love animals, I love nature, I love, um, the wildlife and it's just fortunate that I got the opportunity and got introduced to it at a young age. And so you're now working um, with the Tiki Highwood Foundation. Can you talk to us a little bit about what they're doing and the aims and the work that you do with them? Okay, um, so Tiki Highwood Foundation is a Zimbabwean PVO, so it's a non-profit organization here in Zimbabwe. It was founded in 1994 by a lady called Lisa Highwood in memory of her late father, Tiki Highwood. Um, and basically our organization was primarily focused on pangolin as a focal species and other rare and endangered animal species. And our objective as an organization was to ensure that these animals would be rescued, rehabilitated and released into the wild from um, the wildlife trade and trafficking. And as you can imagine, in 1994, things such as trafficking were still very um, rare and not very common. But um, as time went on and as the trade started to expand, we actually started Started to ask ourselves as an organization why this trade was happening and what was actually happening to the people that were found poaching. And through that, we actually then um, started going into the legislation, the law and the policy and looking as at, at why um, these poachers were getting um, very much close to nothing in terms of penalty. And it was more of a lack of awareness in terms of the prosecution and the lawyers of the state that represent these animals. So we started to do things such as awareness, things such as training, to actually make sure that there was an appreciation of the existing laws. Um, we started to change specific laws so that would ensure that the 
poaching, the unlawful possession, unlawful killing, and lawful hunting of specially protected animals, whether it's a pangolin, it's a rhinoceros or an elephant, we started to make sure that these animals um, killing them or hunting them would actually lead to a nine year minimum mandatory sentence. And um, through our work, I'm proud to say that our country has one of the most um, highly enforced um, laws in terms of prosecution of pangolin in Africa and in the world. Um, and that's through the work that we've been doing here at Tiki Highwood Foundation. So that's part of our work and part of our ethos. So protect the land, protect the species. And I'm so glad that you are doing the work that you're doing. Um, is there such thing as a typical day for you? What, what kind of, what's, what's your routine? So no day is the same. We always say it's never a dull day at Tiki Highwood. Um, but I would say typically I go into the office at around 9 a.m. I start my day. Um, first thing I do is look at the list of cases that we have, the incoming cases. I would say on a day-to-day -day basis, on a weekly basis, we may have between 20 to 50 cases all throughout the country. We have a lot of courts in Zimbabwe and all of them have the jurisdiction um, to try wildlife cases at first instance. So we may have a case, let's say in Bulawayo province, for example, which is about four or five, hour, five hours away from Harare. And at the same time, we have a case in Baitbridge, which is eight hours away from Harare. So my first thing when I get to the office is to check what cases we have, check um, to see that the charges, the docket is complete, the charges are correct, call the relevant um, authorities that are handling the case, be it the police or the public prosecutors, make sure if there's any witnesses that are needed, they're all there. And um, part of our work is to try and make sure that everything, the evidence and everything is tight knit to try and avoid and minimize any risk of corruption or any risk of uh, any foul play in any cases and to make sure that everyone's prepared. Once I do that, then I try to, um, Normally we have a lot of research that we're carrying out because part of our work is also lobbying for policy change. So for example, right now we're working on the animal uh, welfare laws in Zimbabwe that govern the cruelty that happens against animals. So part of my job would be to, um, for example, call the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority to make sure that they're up to date with the current trends, up to date with what we're trying to do call the Ministry of Environment, call the Attorney General's office, carry out research, call our partners all over the world to find out their animal welfare laws and how we, how we can actually improve what we're doing here in Zimbabwe based off of what the global trends or what's happening across the region in Africa or even globally. So that's kind of how a day starts off. Um, but you may get a call in the middle of the day that there's a new pangolin that's been rescued and a new case. And then from there, we're already on the ball and are already advising the police or the rangers as to how they can compile their dockets, how they can write their witness statements and such. So that's kind of a typical day, but there's no such thing as a typical day. I can imagine. Um, and how, I mean, you mentioned earlier that when you first started out, there, was, um, there wasn't a lot of people that were doing the, the justice side and the, and the, um, the terms of uh, punishment were quite low. Um, with, with, the, with the local governments that you're working with, how is the illegal wildlife trade typically seen? Um, I would say in general that um, we're very fortunate that in Zimbabwe, actually, I think it's something that we can also attribute to the culture here. We culturally in Zimbabwe, the majority of the population is either Shona or Ndebele. Um, and the majority of us actually have a totem, which is um, something that's of our natural heritage and it's ancestral and passed on from generation to the next generation. So for example, a lot of us, our totems are a, an animal species. So a lot of us, because we have this totem system where maybe your totem is um, an elephant, which is in Zou and Lovu in uh, our local languages. So your totem might be an elephant, which means that you're expected not to eat that animal or to kill it or to hunt it. You're actually expected to protect it. So fortunately, because we have this uh, customary attachment to the wildlife, there's a lot of respect and revealment, generally speaking, across the board in the Zimbabwean population. So that's really played to our advantage for conservation. 
So based off of that, working with the authorities isn't really something that I would say is a problem. But a lot of the times it's more about just raising awareness as to the challenges that are actually being faced so that they have an appreciation to say, okay, um, poaching has increased over the last two years and we have the evidence to prove this. Because a lot of the times it's maybe not that they don't respect the animal or the conservation. It's more of the lack of awareness of maybe the challenges that um, stakeholders on the ground or the rangers are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we're very much fortunate that um, in that regard, the authorities are very much uh, with us and on, on the board. And now it's more of how can we help each other? How can we uh, capacitate each other, whether it's through trainings, through knowledge exchange and through partnerships? How can we actually protect the spaces in which the animals are living, protect the laws um, and actually enforce and implement the laws where it's necessary? And for those watching back home, he might not be quite as familiar with the illegal wildlife trade. Um, you mentioned earlier that pangolin was one of your kind of um, token animals when first starting at the organization. What, what's the situation with pangolin there and what are the challenges and then how do you combat that? Um, so pangolin is a very, uh, it's a very special animal. Um, I, like to, I like to think that it's very much similar to me because <laughs> physically I've always been a very small, <laughs> rather smaller than most of my friends or smaller than most girls my age. So a pangolin is a very small animal. It's very elusive. Uh, most people have never seen a pangolin in the wild. So actually in our culture here in Zimbabwe, we say if you see a pangolin, it's a sign of good luck. So normally you're actually meant to then give it over to the chief or put it, leave it where you see it because it's a very mystical creature. It's a very special creature. Um, but we've seen that with the demand and trends that we're seeing with illegal wildlife trafficking, mainly coming, the demand is coming from Asia. Um, it's not culturally an animal that we hunt or kill. It's actually culturally an animal that we revere here. But we're seeing that with the with the demand increasing in the Asian communities, we're seeing a lot more poaching and a lot more pangolin being taken out of the wild um, and not actually being handed over to the chiefs who then handed over to parks. Um, so that's what we've been seeing with the trends and that's one of the challenges. So now it's more about re-educating, even though we're moving towards being a more modern society, um, trying to educate in a way that appe appeals to the general public and trying to educate and raise awareness is some of the work that we've been trying to do in order to combat our challenges that we're seeing with the increased poaching here in Zimbabwe. I mean, that feeds quite nicely into my next um, into my next question, because um, I know that as well, you do a lot of work with local communities, with education, as you were just mentioning. What sort of what sort of projects are you doing and have you seen a change in attitude? Um, so we do a lot of work with uh, local communities. So again, because of that cultural aspect where, was, where I was explaining that culturally, um, if people find a pangolin, they're meant to hand it over to the chiefs. We've done a lot of work with um, the local chiefs here in Zimbabwe, where we try to encourage them to say, if someone hands over a pangolin, please um, alert the authorities as quickly as possible and um, alert us as well. So if need be, we can also provide assistance. So we've noticed that, especially in communities, for example, in Chimani Mani, which is actually my, my uh, local hometown or my ancestral home, we work a lot with the chief there, Chief Mosha. And we've noticed that um, in cases where we have poaching in Chipinge or people um, find pangolins in the wild, they automatically hand them over to the chief. And because of that uh, existing system, people know not to try to kill these animals and not to try to hurt and endanger these animals. So you find that in certain instances where we've um, carried out a lot of work with the local communities, we find less poaching in those areas. But in areas which... Um, Maybe there's human wildlife conflict or um, other instances which interfere with the community work that we try to do. That's where you find a lot more poaching and a lot more um, wildlife crimes occurring. So we, we notice that in areas where we work more with the chiefs and we work with schools and try to share our uh, posters and share um, videos with the local communities, we find that there's less poaching and more of an interest as to what people can actually do to contribute. 
And do you do work with the, the local um, schools as well for the next generation to be kind of a bit more ahead of the curve with, when it comes to conservation education? Um, yes, yeah, so we've actually developed a little cartoon. It's a cartoon about a, a young pangolin. So we've actually developed a cartoon um, that we share with the local schools throughout Zimbabwe. And part of what we've been doing as well recently is to try and actually approach local religious leaders to see how we can further work together in their work as they um, have a great influence amongst the local communities and to try and see how we can work together through sto storytelling and through other um, innovative mechanisms which appeal to children such as games, soccer games, sports, and trying to be more interactive with how we impart knowledge and exchange knowledge that's um, somewhat also enshrined and instilled in our culture, in our faith as um, re a religious people. And um, just as humanists and as our Ubuntuism, which is something that's very important to us here in Zimbabwe. So finding more and more new, attractive and innovative ways is something that we we feel very strongly about. And in light of COVID, because we haven't really been able to move as often as we used to be, we're actually trying to do a lot more virtual trainings, trying to play our movies. We've done a documentary movie um, that we try to share with uh, local schools and local organization, youth-led organizations, to try and share and um, impart more knowledge amongst the local young people and local communities. I love that. And I completely agree that the more interactive it is, the more likely the children will um, actually take in what you're saying instead of being lectured for hours on end. Um, yeah. So you're also doing, you mentioned it briefly earlier, um, we were talking about the rescue, rehab and release side. I know you work as well with other org organisations and kind of advise them and help them with, with their projects as well. What's typically the pitfalls that they're finding and how do you then kind of help them with that? Um, so I can only speak, I can speak very briefly about that because normally for my work, it's more on the legal side. But I would say generally some of the challenges that we do face um, here in Zimbabwe with the rescue, rehabilitate and release side is the fact that geographically Zimbabwe is quite a large country. So you find that in a lot of instances where, for example, you have a pangolin that's been involved in the trade for, let's say, um, uh, two weeks or a week where they haven't actually been in a safe habitat where they can actually have access to the food that they need or the nutrients that they need and even the trauma of being involved in a in the trade where they're confined to a small space and unsanitary conditions we find it quite difficult um, because time is of the essence so you find cases where maybe a case will be in uh, bite bridge or a case will be in chimani mani and having to bring that pangolin to get access to the right care that it needs as soon as possible and also respect respecting and being mindful of the legal space. So we found challenges where defense lawyers um, have been using this to the advantage and request for these live pangolin to be kept in, in custody and to appear in court, whereas we know time is of the essence and they actually need to get the care um, as soon as possible. And now they're being held to, so that they can be pre presented in court. So some of the things that we try to do is to actually argue to say that photographic evidence should be sufficient or a parks affidavit from an expert witness should be sufficient to actually attest to the fact that a pangolin was involved in the crime. And so there actually shouldn't be a need for this pangolin to be held in custody, for example, and to be denied of the care that it needs. So those are some of the challenges that we face. And of course, just trying to impart the knowledge and the awareness that maybe other other organizations or other people that may be involved in, in, the, in the process may not have. That's also something that we're working on trying to improve as an organization. Um, but generally, I think uh, we've we found that a lot of people are quite receptive, um, especially the authorities. I think everyone has an appreciation of the fact that um, as Tiki Highwood Foundation, we have the knowledge and the expertise. And at the end of the day, it's all about the animals. I think that's what we always try to say. It's all about the animals. So fortunately, I think, um, yeah, those are some of the challenges. But I'd like to say that everyone at least is on the same page when it comes to um, why we're doing what we're doing. Absolutely. We've got a question coming through and they're asking if you're finding success with the local religious leaders. 
Um, I would say generally everyone has been quite receptive. I think all across the board, ac across most religions, we find that there's a, a general respect for for animals, a general respect for nature and a general respect for the environment that we see. And it's more about just channeling that energy and channeling that message to say that, you know, these are creatures that were created for us to enjoy and for future generations. So for us, we also have a responsibility, whether regardless of the religion that you are, we all have a responsibility to actually try to create an environment where we protect the land, protect the species. So I think um, generally, I would say the the we've we've received quite positive uh, feedback and a lot of interest actually from the religious communities and um, groups. Yeah. That's fantastic. I'm so pleased. And um, also we, we touched on it earlier when you were saying that you couldn't go to the schools because of COVID, but what impact has COVID had for you in terms of doing the legal side? Has there been an increase in cases? What, what are you seeing here? Um, so the COVID, uh, COVID has had quite an interesting impact on our work. Um, I think because here in Zimbabwe, we've had instances where we've gone through a, a lockdown period where um, that means that the court process had slowed down and it meant that um, a lot of our cases were now being remanded out of custody. And what it means is that when a case is remanded out of custody, that means that the accused persons or the poachers um, would actually be charged and a docket compiled, but they would not be held in um, in police custody or state custody. And then they would actually be released and given a trial date at a later stage when the courts are now functional or operational. So that means that there was a backlog of cases and it meant that a lot of the accused persons would actually abscond or run away and not appear in court again. Because once, it, once they've been released, a lot of them will actually change addresses, give a false address and um, take it as a chance to freedom and, and a chance not to be prosecuted for the crime. So I would say that has been one of the <clears throat> hardest pitfalls that we've seen um, due to COVID. Um, but generally, I would say poaching has been consistent because, I mean, COVID has also had a negative um, impact on a lot of people's livelihoods in terms of their economic and financial uh, well-being. And the more that people struggle, the more that they look at criminal activity as a means of um, income. So we've seen that poaching hasn't stopped. And unfortunately, even though the court systems may have slowed down or other... other um, working working fields or other means of working may have stopped poaching hasn't stopped so that's been one of our greatest challenges where the cases are going up but the actual law enforcement and the ability to do the prosecution um has has been uh, diminished by covid and if people want to be able to support the work that you're doing um, is there a way for them to be able to do that? I know you mentioned earlier, obviously, you've got a website and social media. So please do go and check both of those out if you're watching this back home. Um, but yeah, what's the, what's the best way people can support you? Um, so I like to believe that everyone has something that they can do to contribute because even for me as a lawyer, it's I think that for a lot of lawyers, it's quite strange when I say, ah, oh, I'm an environmental lawyer that's working mainly with animals and conservation. I think everyone has a role to play. Whether you're an accountant, you can do the, you can look into the money laundering side. Whether you're an artist, you can draw art that inspires people to actually protect the environment. If you're an actress or an actor, you can um, create uh, visual art that portrays the images of conservation and send the message across. So I think in whatever we do, we also have a responsibility to be innovative and ask ourselves, how can I use my talent or how can I use my gift or my education? I mean, you're you're a journalist and you're creating this platform where conservation can be discussed and talked about. So there's no one thing that any one person can do. I think we can all do something, even if it's just having meatless Mondays where you eat 
uh, you refrain from eating meat so that you can contribute towards conservation and climate change and the environment, even if it's not littering, even if it's not running your water, your water in the tap as you're brushing your teeth. And um, one of the things that I feel passionate about as well is the youth and blogging, talking about it with your friends, just having one conversation to say, hmm, did you know that pangolin are the most trafficked mammal in the world? Or, hmm, did you know that uh, poaching is a problem? So just talking about it and trying to do the little that we can and using whatever talent we have to spread the message, I think that's the most important thing, raising awareness and letting people know that poaching is a crime. Killing wildlife without a permit is a crime. Yeah. I absolutely love that. I completely agree that everyone's got their own skills that they can bring to the table and help in conservation. And we've got another question coming through asking if um, when you're doing the cases, are they time consuming in court? And is there such thing as a fixed consequence? Um, OK, so in terms of time, yes, the, we've noticed. But I think that's across the board in terms of the legal system that a lot of cases generally take time. And one of the things that we try to do is to raise awareness across the board from the public prosecutors to the magistrates to the police, raising awareness that these cases are highly important cases and they're also time sensitive because the more that someone, um, the, the longer that the trial takes, the more susceptible and the more likely it is that a person um, who's accused of poaching, who knows that their case is taking time, the more likely it is that they won't appear for their next uh, court hearing um, and the more likely they are to run away. So that's something that we try to raise awareness because you'd find that in the early days, maybe a lot of um, state public prosecutors would maybe not really understand the importance of these cases and maybe would say, oh, no, but I have a theft case or I have a robbery case or I have a, you know, a murder case. Why should I prioritize these wildlife crime cases? So raising awareness to actually explain that these are high profile cases, these are important cases, raising awareness and making sure that they also feel um, a sense of ownership and a sense of urgency in themselves when they're handling this case and understand the importance of the case. That's what also helps to fast track the cases. Um, but it's something that we're working on closely with the National Prosecuting Authority. And at the moment, one of the things that we're very much passionate about and working towards a specialization of wildlife crime as a crime in Zimbabwe, making sure that there's a specialized court system where wildlife crimes are actually heard and fast-tracked. Um, and to answer the question as to whether there's um, the sentencing structure in Zimbabwe for specially protected animals. These are animals that are highly endangered or animals that are revered um, for various reasons, such as pangolins, such as rhinoceros, um, such as the painted dogs, for example. These are animals that do have a minimum mandatory sentence of nine years. So if you're actually caught um, poaching an unlawful possession, hunting or killing any of these animals, then you actually are liable to be sentenced to nine years minimum on first offence and 11 years on second offence, unless there are mitigatory circumstances or special circumstances that will be used to mitigate the crime, I mean the sentence, sorry. So um, that's kind of how it works in Zimbabwe. I hope that sufficiently answered the question. No, that's great. Thank you. And if people are watching this back home and they're seeing you as an inspiration, what advice would you give to them to follow in your footsteps? Um, the advice that I would give is to just read, do your research, read, just Google, read the news. If you can put a Google alert about wildlife so you're actually aware of what's happening and actually have an appreciation of how big of a crime this really is. Because even for us in Zimbabwe, I think we all look at wildlife in the context of our national parks, in the context of Wangi, which has one of the largest elephant populations in the world. We look at it from a local perspective, which is great, and it gives us a sense of ownership. But it's very important to even understand and appreciate that this is even bigger than just Wangi. This is a multi-billion dollar industry and a crime. 
um, where people that are linked to unlawful trading of ivory or pangolin have been linked to the arms trade. They've been linked to human trafficking. They've been linked to narcotics and drug trafficking. So this is a crime that involves a lot of people and a lot of crimes and a bigger picture. So I always try to encourage people to even think beyond just Zimbabwe. Think about it as an international crime. Think about it as how we can all contribute and how it affects you know one crime leads to another crime I believe and I also believe that um you know we all have a responsibility and we all can do something and it starts with us so to just say to the future generation of conservationists or wildlife lawyers or anyone that's passionate about the environment that just read and research talk to people have discussions because just by speaking to one person you also just um ignite that discussion and ignite that interest in them. Brilliant. I love that. Well, I've only got one more question left. Um, and if you're watching this back home and you would like to ask a question, then please pop it on the comments section and I will put it towards her. Um, so for me, I always like to try and finish on a, on a positive note and give some inspiration. What would you say was your favorite success story? So... <laughs> That's a very difficult one for me to answer because we've had, I can't even count how many cases we've had since I joined the team in 2017. <laughs> I think there's over 200 cases, but one of my, I would like to look back at a more recent case that I found very exciting and um, very interesting actually. One of the cases that we had um, last year in September, we had a case that involved, the. it was one of the first, actually it is the first wildlife crime case that we've had in Zimbabwe involving live uh, animal species, where we had uh, a consignment, a truck that was traveling from the DRC um, headed towards South Africa. And this truck was stopped at the one-stop border post in Shirundu, which is the border post between Zambia and Zimbabwe. And when it was stopped, it was then discovered that this uh, truck had um, 26 live endangered um, monkey species, sorry, primate species um, that were coming from the DRC. And once it was stopped, they had a permit and these permits were in French. Um, they had a permit from the DRC, which was later discovered to be fake. So it was a very much a big case because not only did it involve um, smuggling of wild animals, it involved smuggling of live endangered animal species that had gone from all the way from the DRC through Zambia all the way to Zimbabwe, confined in unsanitary conditions, confined in conditions that are inhumane and um, would be described as animal cruelty. And one of the things that was exciting for me was actually understanding and appreciating that one, this was the first case that we'd ever seen of this nature. And to actually appreciate the fact that this crime was being carried out during a time where we have COVID regulations, during a time where people actually shouldn't really be traveling, but still someone has the has the ability to try and carry out such a crime where they move these live species with fake permits, taking advantage of the language barrier and taking advantage of the situation at hand. Um, and it was such a big case that we actually realized that the laws in Zimbabwe, where we have the wildlife laws that we're still using, have been in place since 1975. So the laws actually didn't have a provision for smuggling. So we had to actually look through all the laws in Zimbabwe and try to find the best charges possible to be able to actually charge these people um, with the crime that they committed. So we actually ended up using a Customs and Exercise Act as opposed to the Parks and Wildlife Act. We ended up using the Public Health Act, which looks at the fact that them transporting these uh, primates at a time where we have COVID and zoonotic diseases spreading would actually be against the safety of our public health as Zimbabweans. So that it was actually looking at how we can use other laws to be able to pr protect um, wildlife in Zimbabwe and how we can actually better improve our existing laws. So that was a really big case that we had. Unfortunately, um, I'm proud to say that these accused persons were convicted and the animals were safely repatriated back to the DRC and are safely back in a safe sanctuary in the DRC. So that was 
that's one of my positive cases where not only did, were we able to convict these accused people, but we're a actually able to learn more about how we need to improve the law and how we can actually use other laws such as public health, such as customs and um, the movement of goods as a means to be able to protect the wildlife and actually repatriate them back to their home country. I love that. That's such a great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have one person <laughs> come through and they're asking what percentage of people who get charged are found guilty? Um, so it actually depends on the crime. I would say for Pangolin, we actually have an over 90% success rate for all cases where accused persons are brought to court. So from point of arrest up until prosecution, we have a nine, over 90% success rate for cases that we monitor. Um, so yeah, it's Zimbabwe is quite good and quite uh, pretty much ahead of the stream when it comes to um, prosecution of wildlife crime cases. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've absolutely loved having you on. And I think it's such an interesting story to hear of the work that you're doing. So thank you. And thank you for helping to support wildlife. Um, is there anything you want to finish with before we say goodbye? Um, I'd just like to say thank you to you, Kathleen, and thank you to everyone that's joined us on this platform today. And I just hope that everyone is inspired to actually ask themselves, what can I do to contribute? How can I continue to further uh, further enhance what's happening in conservation? Whether you're an artist, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a journalist, whatever you are, even as a student, what can I do to further help enhance conservation in my country or in my space or in the world? Um, that's the only thing that I would like to say. Right. That's a great way to finish. And um, we've had lots of lovely comments and feedback throughout the show. So thank you, everyone, for your support. Um, please do like, comment, share um, all of the videos that we're having. We've got some great people coming on. We've had some brilliant past guests. And the more people that can see these videos, then the more people can become aware of the incredible work that people are doing around the world to protect our wildlife and wild spaces. So thank you so much again for coming on. And for everyone else back home, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.